Chief Dyer, thanks for meeting with the GB Wire. You bet. Thanks, Bill. A lot of debate about how many police officers uh, would best serve Fresno. A lot of numbers put out there through the years. How many police officers does Fresno really need? Currently, we have 815 officers. Where we were in 2009, uh, we had 847 officers. And the city of Fresno has grown uh, at a rapid pace over the last nine years. But I would say today, uh, we need a minimum of 900 police officers in this organization that we had the latitude to use in a manner in which we saw fit. It's not necessarily how many officers you have in an organization, it's how many officers do you have the discretion to use as you want to use them, and what the strategies are in terms of how you use those officers. And on top of that, at any given time, you have a certain number of officers uh, that are on a long-term absence. So when you start factoring those in, and you know that you have to have a certain number of officers working in investigative assignments, uh, officers in traffic, officers in proactive units, patrol seven days a week, 24 hours a day, it takes an enormous amount of officers in order to meet those needs. And so uh, looking ahead, let's say five years from now, uh, can you project uh, what the number should be? I think the, uh, the projections of how many officers you hire per year should stay consistent with keeping uh, the department uh, somewhere around 1.8 officers per thousand. So now I'm going to ask a question I see on social media all the time. I saw Chief Dyer's uh, latest Crime View meeting and he says crime is going down. If it's going down, why do we need more officers? I'm sure I'm not the first to ask this question. But that's compared to last year. Last year we had an increase in violent crime. So what we're reducing violent crime, yes, but compared to last year, which was high. We want to get to that place where we were back in 2006, 7, 8, where every year we were seeing crime reductions. It's sometimes shameful in law enforcement to see that certain cases like child abuse, sexual assault, are not being worked in a timely fashion. Those are the things that people may not see. They may see the crime numbers, but they don't see the investigative caseload. They don't see the delayed response time. They don't see the delay in 911 answer times. We're measured by all of those. My name is Don Gross. I'm a captain with the Fresno Police Department, and I'm the Bureau Commander of our Communications and Data Analysis Bureau. If you'd like to follow me, we can come through and I'll uh, give you a little idea of what you're looking at. The consoles on the center of the room back are our complaint taker stations. And what complaint takers do is when you call 911 or when you call the Fresno Police Department, those are the folks answering those calls. We currently have a staffing of uh, just under 100, mid-90s, and by state standards, we should have staffing in uh, about 140. So what that means is, is we don't have enough people. As you can see, a lot of these stations are empty. Uh, we don't have enough personnel to answer those calls during our peak times. What this screen up here tells us, the squares to the left are the exact same position as the desks are. So when you see a gray, gray bar across the top, that means there's nobody sitting there. There are two people available to take a call, and there's four people that are actually on the phone right now with someone. What that's critical for us to know is that at any given time, that green bar is all the resource we have available. So if three people in a city of 600,000 call 911, we only have two people to answer those calls at the moment. And that's the critical part. Because if it is a critical incident, if somebody uh, has a medical aid, uh, if somebody has, has been involved in a violent crime, uh, we need to get that information as rapidly as possible because after that information is received, it still goes over to a dispatcher who has to look for an available officer. And depending on our staffing, there may or may not be an officer available. But even if there is, it takes that officer some time to get from where they are to where that location is. If it's a drowning and there's a child in the pool, it pushes that time back. 
if it's a, uh, a victim of a shooting and there's someone you know that has been shot, it pushes that time back. So every time that we can gain a few seconds even on an answer time for 911, it gives us a better chance to focus on what that problem is and how to get personnel there more rapidly. The Fresno City budget, significant amount of it is uh, dedicated to public safety, police and fire, and uh, yet the need is so great. Uh, Put yourself in the, the mayor or the city council's chair for a second. How would you wrestle with this, and what do you think about the decisions that have been made? Well, I am very confident uh, that Mayor Brand, uh, that our city manager, that our uh, city council um, all place a high priority on public safety. There's no question. It's whether or not the revenues will support the number of officers and dispatchers and equipment that we need, not only in the police department, but the fire department, to be able to meet all of those expectations and needs within a community. And the answer right now is no. When you look at what the revenues are today and what they're projected to be over the next five years, they are nowhere close to what is needed to be able to um, meet those needs in our community. And absent having some other form of a sustained revenue base for this city that's dedicated to public safety, I don't know how that need gets met in, in, in the future. And what I'll be doing is uh, introducing you to our crime scene investigation manager, Scott West. Uh, Scott, and uh, what we'll do is we will uh, take you through the CSI section. Okay, so we're gonna go into what we call our evidence processing room. Way back in the day, it used to be called a crime lab, but with the advent of all the CSI programs on TV, the public's expectations of what a crime lab is supposed to look like isn't what we have. So we changed the room to an evidence processing room, and that's right here. This is the, the central point where all the evidence from crime scenes comes. We bring it in here first, and we sort it, and uh, then lay it out and begin our processing of it for fingerprints or for DNA. Uh, this room was built back in the early 60s and it is obviously way, way, way too small for what needs to be done in today's evidence processing environment. There's plenty of times where we have multiple crime scenes uh, that are going on and the techs will bring their evidence in. It can be a little challenging to keep all the evidence separated and what's really important is not to have any cross-contamination. At the same time, this is where we do our daily narcotic presumptive testing. This is also a room that is used by attorneys and detectives when they're preparing for a case. They'll bring all the evidence from the property room and come over here and they'll, they'll lay it out here and then all the attorneys go through the evidence and that's happening at the same time that we're trying to, to work on crime scene evidence too. So really we should have two or three rooms this size to keep all of those functions separate. And right now we're trying to just make it work with this one room. If you pan around and look at it, you know, over the years we keep adding equipment and technology to keep up with the standards of, of today. You know, about a year and a half ago, we, we came in and painted over the top of the cabinets just to kind of cover up 50 years worth of blemishes and marks and gouges and all that. You know, gas lines that are, that are there that we no longer use, but way back in the day they had Bunsen burners. This here is an exhaust fuming hood that we use when we do chemical processing and we want to exhaust the vapors out to keep everybody safe. It's OSHA compliant, it, it does the job, but it's really old and kind of just antique -y. Uh, It works and we're glad it's here, but uh, the, modern, the modern exhaust hoods are much smaller and much more uh, efficient and a lot quieter. All of the evidence from crime scenes that needs to be fingerprinted, we bring into this little room right here and uh, we use the old fashioned fingerprint powder technique that we see in the movies and stuff. This is a, a, a newer piece of equipment. It's newer, I say about 10 years old, but uh, this room is, is really small and it doesn't have the right ventilation. So gradually, and, and we just painted this room and painted these cabinets, but gradually this fingerprint powder will stick to everything and it'll turn it really dark uh, because it's just very fine. If you look at like this trash can right here, 
you know, this has been in this room forever and you can see how black it is and that's what a lot of the room looked like. All right, now we're gonna go into our main office where all the techs have their desks. This office is used 24-7 uh, by our crew and every desk has at least two occupants in it. Over the years we've had to do live scan registrants and applicants and so we had to find the room for it in this office so we're doing that while the techs are trying to do fingerprint comparisons and write reports from homicides etc cetera, etc. Cetera. At the same time we've got our prisoner processing going on back in this room and sometimes that can get really really uh, and, and loud and uh, there's a lot of commotion back there and again that's all a distraction for what's going on with, with these folks. So that brings me to uh, the mayor proposed a uh, half cent sales tax split between uh, parks. We know there's great need for upgrade to our parks and uh, also public safety and it went to the council and uh, it was shot down and three council members who uh, brand themselves as conservatives and law and order voted against it. How disappointed were you? Well, I'm disappointed to know that there doesn't appear to be any answers on the table or recommended solutions for meeting that revenue shortfall. At some point, somebody has to come forth and have the courage to say, we do not have the revenue to support public safety in the city the manner which we need to. Therefore, we have to do X. And right now, the only one that's come up with an X has been the mayor. And that is a half cent sales tax that would be split between public safety and parks. Unfortunately, there's no, uh, there's no momentum for that to occur. Well, at least not on the council level. And now we are uh, left with the situation in which a Parks only uh, tax hike will be on the November ballot. You know, I applaud the effort of those individuals that are out there um, trying to enhance parks, beautification. But the reality is, uh, at least in the position I sit in today as a police chief, that is not the priority for this city. When I look out and see the number of people being victimized in our community, the delayed response time for victims and people calling the police from our department. And when I see the incredible workload that these officers have and the equipment that they're operating with, the priority should be public safety. When you consider that a piece of safety equipment in the life is five years, then this is an 18. I'd like to introduce you to our SWAT commander, Lieutenant Joey Alvarez, and he'll be giving you a little tour of our SWAT bus and uh, what it all entails. So the SWAT bus is a 1977 flexible bus that was in service uh, as a public transportation bus until 1992. When it was taken out of service, we took it over and it became our SWAT command vehicle. Uh, flexible went out of business about 20 years ago, uh, which has made getting parts a little hard. And on our last two SWAT calls, uh, the bus was unavailable because it had broken down. Some of the issues that we're currently facing as we look at the bus, although it has been amazing for us, a simple issue, we can no longer get parts uh, for the windshield wiper. This is an, both an electric and an air system that we can't get anywhere. Uh, it makes it's a little difficult during the rainy season when we have to remove the vehicle uh, for emergency services. Some other issues that we've run into, this is an air operated bus. It now takes almost 15 minutes to power up and get air into the system before we can safely drive the bus away from its hangar. We can no longer get airbags for the unit and we had to specifically uh, design and have custom made airbags just to keep the unit in service. Some of the other items that we're running into problems with are the electrical as well as overall parts. If you want to follow me, I'll show you the different ins and outs of the bus. So the SWAT bus is a key component in a SWAT call, not only for the safety of the officers, but for the community and the suspect as well. Uh, the SWAT bus is broken into three parts. The first is the command center. As you can see, we utilize this area for tactical dispatching. It has computers, CAD, uh, and radios so that we can communicate directly with the officers on scene. 
that they can run information or receive information as necessary. Officers actually staff this in the field uh, as well as bring in other items to communicate with negotiators, uh, to communicate with other specialty units on, uh, on site. The back section is basically serves twofold. One, we can uh, conduct briefings in here. Uh, the other it houses our larger equipment. As you can see, we've started to grow out of the bus. The bus was specifically designed to house teams and do briefings, not necessarily um, store all of the larger items, whether it be specialized munition launchers, lights, electronic surveillance equipment, specialty shields, ballistic helmets, medical supplies for the uh, team doctor and uh, EMT, breaching equipment. Over the years, we've even had to, the bus has been in service so long, we've gone through different variations of radios. So this is all taxing on the electrical system as we've tried to outfit the unit appropriately. Thanks again, Joey. Sir. Thank you so much for joining us today and taking a look at some of the challenges we face here in the Fresno Police Department. Have a great one and stay safe. So uh, let's say a public safety parks tax passes or just a public safety tax. You'll be able to hire more officers. You'll be able to <clears throat> buy new guns instead of reconditioned guns. But I wonder about the impact on the Fresno County justice system. Uh, will there be uh, space in the jail if you're ca catching more bad guys? Will there be enough uh, prosecutors to uh, try cases against people that are arrested? Will there be enough probation officers mm -hmm. uh, to handle the caseload? Mm -hmm. Well, just because more police officers are added doesn't necessarily mean that increases the workload for other components of the criminal justice system. In fact, I would argue that the more police officers you have, the less work that you have for other components of the criminal justice system because an increased presence of police officers in neighborhoods will prevent and deter crime. But if you look at what's happened in California in the last six or seven years with decriminalization, um, no matter how many officers are in neighborhoods, the laws are not there in, in order to uh, support uh, large numbers of arrests. So I think an increased presence of officers in and around neighborhoods, uh, employing the right strategies, uh, being involved in community policing, reducing calls for service through proactive type efforts, problem solving, uh, reduces the overall workload of the entire criminal justice system, including the jails and the prisons.